far we have learnt certain techniques for solving CFD problems. Now the question is how to apply these techniques, CFD after all is a subject where you want to apply the understandings that we have developed for solving practical problems and once you are interested to do that the first and foremost step will be to write a CFD code. Now uh, these days lots of CFD codes are available, some CFD codes are commercially available, some are open source codes and some are in house codes that is codes developed by various research groups for solving their tailor made customized problems. Now whatever may be the case it is often necessary to use a code rather than starting to write a code from the scratch. It is many times uh, not a very bad idea though not a very idealistic approach because uh, nobody will give us a credit of reinventing a wheel. So if somebody starts writing a CFD code at, at a particular stage and is at the end interested to solve a very challenging CFD problem, maybe it will take years to write the code and then solve the problem and one may be interested to use a code in a way to adapt the code to the particular use, particular requirement of the problem that he or she is interested to solve. And that may be one of the practical approaches for modern day CFD where you really have lots of CFD codes available. Question is if such a generic code is available with you, what are the intricate features that are common to most of these codes and how to go about the use of these codes for solving the problems. Now uh, because of obvious restrictions we will not be considering any particular commercial code in this particular lecture for illustrating that how to go about that, but we will consider a generic approach that can be used for any, any, any sort of CFD code and to go ahead with solving a problem. So uh, let us uh, uh, try to go through this presentation and let us see that what a generic CFD code contains. A generic CFD code contains three basic modules, one is a preprocessor, another is a solver and another is a post processor. So let us go through the basic structure of a CFD code, many times we are abstracted of this basic structure when you are using a code because you are only using the user interface. But if you see that uh, first if you consider the preprocessor. The preprocessor uh, has different functionalities, one of the important functionalities is to create a geometry and a mesh for solving a problem. We will go through one or two examples to illustrate that, but then what you need to do? You need to set the transport equations that need to be solved because the code does not know that which equations you need to solve. So you have to specify which, which equations you need to solve, set the thermophysical properties. Uh, if it is an unsteady problem set the time step sizes, even if it is a steady state problem and you are using an unsteady mode, you can use a large single time step to convert an unsteady mode implementation into a equivalent steady state implementation. Set the convergence criteria or the convergence parameters, set the initialization parameters, set the boundary conditions and set the source terms. Uh, these are certain presetting things that you could do. Then you can initialize the solution when you go through the solver, then adjust the source terms and boundary conditions if they dynamically vary with iteration. Remember that in CFD mostly we use iterative techniques and one of the common reasons is that in the cases in which we want to solve Navier-Stokes equations which are nonlinear equations, where iterative techniques are much more suited than the elimination techniques. Then you if for example, if we are interested for solving a fluid flow problem, then we must solve at least the continuity equation and the momentum equation. This is the basic requirement of solving the flow field. Then you can solve other scalar transport equations depending on which other equations you need to solve. For example, if you require to solve energy equation, then you can solve that. If you require to solve the species conservation equation, you can solve another scalar transport. Then update the properties if they dynamically vary with iteration or time. So some of the properties may not be constant, but they may vary with iteration or time <coughs> and that you need to update and then you check for convergence. If convergence is not achieved, you go to the next time step or next iteration. In this way, iterations are done in a solver and once iterations have converged and you have come to the end of your time 
time domain time equal to last if it is yes then you come out of this solver and you go to the post processor where you visualize and analyze the results in terms of graphical outputs like in terms of contour plots vector plots like that so uh, we just quickly go through these steps uh, for a generic case say first you set geometry and mesh so for example it is a gui for selecting whether it's a 2d or a 3d problem then the domain lengths along x and y direction and select the equations that you need to solve so for example here you solve momentum equation energy equation and some additional scalar transport equations then set the thermophysical properties the thermophysical properties may be constants may be specified as function of the variable itself for example the thermal conductivity may be a function of temperature say a linear function of temperature so th these are certain facilities which may be available with the gui or if even if it is not a gui it may be available with a standard user interface not a graphical user interface then uh, it may be a programmable user interface through which you do or like this one where you have the graphical user interface so you can also have a step function of temperature that is the uh, these are these are some options but you could have several other options if none of these options fit for example if you say that you have a property variation which is neither constant nor linear nor piecewise constant but some other variations then you have to write a user defined function for that and we will see later on that how to write user defined function now set the initialization parameters for example you can set the initial velocity and then you can set the time steps so you can have a fixed time step size or you can have an adaptive time step size for example a problem can have different time scales at different instants of time for example you have a domain you suddenly hit the domain so what you see that initially there will be rapid transients so you need to keep very small time steps to capture the changes within that small time interval but later on when the system has adjusted that change to itself then you may require uh, you, you may you you may employ a larger time step size so you may use adaptive time step size uh, then you can set maximum iterations that you may allow per time step if it has not converged within that iterations so remember that within each time step it is solving all the equations algebraically so it has to go through the iterations so if you if you maximum number of iterations has been exceeded then it may give you a message that convergence has not been achieved if it does not satisfy the <coughs> convergence criteria then uh, certain additional things like if gravity uh, is important for your problem as a body force then you enable gravity and uh, set the auto save frequency that means if you want to save results within uh, a interval of certain time steps so for example it's a problem say where you have the time domain from 0 to 10 second and every one second you want to see the plots so every one second you want to store the result of your analysis and th so that is what we mean by auto save frequency then set convergence parameters so convergence criterion and the relaxation factors and uh, for the convergence criteria you can use the relative error tolerance so we have already discussed that why we generally prefer relative error as uh, a criteria for convergence rather than absolute error then set the boundary conditions so you can uh, use uh, different types of boundary conditions for example momentum equation then energy equation so you can have boundary conditions for different equations species transport equation and for any other generic scalar equations so for each type of equations you can use different boundary conditions we will go into the boundary conditions in more details through one or two examples that we will see later on then let us come to the concept of user defined codes so you usually you use user defined codes for accommodating something which is not there in the standard gui or standard programmable interface so for example if you have variable thermophysical properties and that you want to implement that is one case then if you have user defined code for boundary conditions so for example if you are interested to have certain boundary conditions which are not there in the standard gui so then you can use the user defined code or maybe some special source terms 
So, usually see your CFD you can make your CFD code a fool by implementing some equations which are not the standard fluid flow equations. The, the equations may be in whatever form you may write it in a general conservative form and then whatever extra terms that have appeared you dump that in the form of a source term. So, you can we have already discussed that in CFD when you write a governing equation how do we make a CFD code understand that it is in the standard conservative form. We write it in the standard conservative form it differs from one equation to the other in terms of a diffusion coefficient and a source term. So, if you specify the diffusion coefficient and a source term no matter how complicated it is then you can implement any equation in that particular form to solve the problem. So, you may re, you may require user defined code for co implementing complicated source terms in that way you can implement <coughs> very complicated physical issues in a generic CFD solver. Then you press the submit button to start the background solver code in this example and it will it will run and it will be showing you the level of iterations and how it is converging and all this. Then you can uh, go to the post processing part. So, once the results are obtained you can show contour plots. So, con what are contour plots? So, you, these are iso lines that means values lines with with constant values different lines with different constant values and you can also show vector plots where you have the velocity field for example. Now, let us go to the user defined subroutine or in, in some cases it is also called as user defined function. Subroutine is a term borrowed from Fortran and function is a term borrowed from C, but I, I in either way it means the same. So, what is a user defined subroutine? It is a subroutine written by the user that can be linked dynamically to the solver code to enhance the standard features of the code. Since the standard interface cannot be programmed for all possible anticipated needs, see somebody who develops a CFD code uh, develops a standard interface either a graphical interface or a programmable interface, but that cannot be customized to all possible needs because different problems may have different intricate features with the governing equations, boundary conditions, etc and different in different cases you require to customize all these that is the boundary condition source terms and thermophysical properties. In many cases these need to be dynamically adjusted during the solution procedure. This is achieved by dynamically linking the user defined subroutines with the main solver program where it updates the desired thermophysical properties boundary conditions and the source term with every iteration. So, let us quickly see that where do you require user access to the solver code. So, set the custom thermophysical properties, boundary conditions and source terms before entering the solution loop. This you usually set as an initialization if you do not want this to dynamically change or even if you want this to be dynamically changed you at least initialize those. So, that is one of the place one of the places then you may require to dynamically adjust the source term and the boundary conditions as the solution progresses that is another place and you may require to dynamically update the properties. So, usually the whole idea is that the solver of a good CFD code is very robust. So, you do not want to touch the solver, you do not want to get into the solver, keep the solver as it is, but try to have stronger interaction or more intricate interaction with the solver by writing user defined functions by facilitating the solver to address more complicated problems than the standard GUI uh, will allow. Now, uh, when you are writing the user defined functions you need to be careful about certain things like if you are using a grid terminology, if you are using a staggered grid for example, what is the grid terminology? If you are using a collocated grid then uh, the terminology is relatively straightforward, but if you are using a staggered grid you do not have the same locations where you solve for the momentum equations and the other scalar equations. So, you basically have different control volumes. So, in this particular figure wherever you have i with subscript u that indicates that this is the location this is the index where you are solving the x momentum u momentum equation. Similarly, j with index v will indicate that you are you are trying to solve for the y momentum equation. So, i index for x momentum and j index for y momentum 
and uh, in this particular example we are using certain nomenclature it is uh, it may be better to introduce that so number of main cells nx comma ny nx along x and ny along y number of u cells is nx minus 1 comma ny so because it is staggered number of cells for x momentum equation solution will be one less than the total number of cells for the main uh, uh, for the other scalar equation similarly number of v cells is nx uh, and a, comma ny minus 1. Now you may use loops while writing the user defined subroutines. So this is an example where you are use writing loops using Fortran as a structure. Now you, I mean there are certain user defined functions which are neither Fortran nor C they have their own structures. So this is just a generic exam, example do not try to think that this is the user defined function syntax for all. We are not trying to teach you a syntax. Uh, this is this is not the whole intention is not to teach you how to run a particular code, but to illustrate that what is the basic principle in running different codes, what is the common principle. So here uh, for example, you can use this do loops and n do. So this is just like a for loop in instead of a do loop if you use c. So if you have a scalar equation source terms, see the source terms are defined for only interior grid points not the boundary points because source terms are for control volumes. Boundary points do not belong to any control volumes. So that is why you see that i starts from 2. So in the scalar equation i starts from 2 it ends with nx minus 1. So it ensures that it is only for the interior grid points. For the u momentum equation on the other hand you see i starts with 3 because it is staggered it is shifted by 1 so i starts with 3. On the other hand for the V momentum equation J starts with 3. This is for the source term for the interior grid points and uh, for different boundaries you have different values of I and J. For example, if you have a square domain or a rectangular domain, a rectangular domain will have top, bottom, left, right like that. So we are giving an illustration through a rectangular domain. So I equal to 1 to NX for the bottom. So remember that horizontal line we are considering as x and vertical line as y. So bottom i equal to 1 to nx and j equal to 1. The top will be j equal to n, ny, left will be i equal to 1 and right will be i equal to nx. So this is for the scalar equation. For the u momentum equation the i will be from 2 to nx not 1 to nx that is the only difference and for v momentum equation j will be from 2 to ny that is the difference. So let us go through some representative examples for user defined functions. So let us consider that you require a gravity acting in x direction. Let us say that your code has gravity acting along y direction. Now you have to implement gravity acting along x direction. Of course you can swap x and y if you want. But if you want to implement it by yourself, let us say your code has no provision of implementing a gravity source term and you want to implement that. So where do you want to implement the gravity source term? You want to implement the gravity source term in the x momentum equation and the gravity source term is let us say it is because of the natural convection. So it is like rho g beta into t minus t, t infinity or t reference. So just recall from your basic understanding of natural convection that if you use a Bosenix approximation and then you can write the gradient of the variation of density in terms of the variation of temperature and that is expressed in terms of a volumetric expansion coefficient. So it will come out to be rho g beta into t minus t reference or t minus t infinity depending on uh, whether uh, it is an enclosure or it is it is a problem with uh, atmospheric boundary layer. So whatever it is, now you have to keep one thing in mind. If you are using a staggered control volume, what is the, cha what is the challenge here? See you have the temperature solved at the main grid points, whereas you have to specify the x momentum source term at the staggered location. So you have to interpolate the temperature at the staggered control volume location as a function of the temperature at the main grid points. That is what we are doing in this example. 
So, for example, we can do we can linearly interpolate the temperature. So, you uh, that is what we are schematically showing here you have x i minus 1 x i and we require to interpolate it at x i u that is a staggered location and we require to find out what is t i u comma j. So, for that we are using this linear interpolation formula and in this linear interpolation formula uh, we are using uh, a term f x which is like x i u minus x i minus 1 by x i minus x i minus 1. Uh, this, this is a particular variable which uh, in, in the code that is being used that variable is already defined. So, if you know that there are certain variables which are already defined in the code you may make use of that to uh, like uh, enhance your calculations. So, once you do that let us see let us go through the structure see if eq equation logical equal to x mom that means if it is the x momentum equation how will your code know that for which equation you are interested to write the source term. So, for that there must be one if. So, one if for letting the code know that for which equation then you go to the loop and write the corresponding average t see i equal to 3 to n x minus 1 because it is staggered along x j equal to 2 to n y minus 1 because it is not staggered along y it is staggered along x only. So, uh, uh, then we are writing th this is con is like the constant source term like uh, that s c plus s p phi p that s c we are calling as con. So, that con equal to con i uh, con i comma j equal to con i comma j that is whatever was initialized plus some rho initial that is some the reference density into g into beta into t average minus t reference. So, that is how you simply implement the natural convection. Then another example let us say that you have a thermosolutal convection what is thermosolutal convection. So, we know that if there are cases in which you have free surface flows that is you have an interface between two fluids say an inter say or a free surface where the interface is between a liquid and a gas. Now, you may have a temperature gradient on the surface of the liquid and for many liquids in fact, for most liquids the surface tension is a strong function of temperature. So, if you have a gradient of temperature it induces a gradient in surface tension and because of the gradient of surface tension it can introduce it can induce an interfacial flow which we call as Marangoni flow. Now, you can have a temperature uh, gradient you may also have a concentration gradient. So, if you have a multi component system in the multi component system you may have a concentration gradient and the concentration gradient the surface tension may also be a strong function of concentration. So, you can write the boundary condition in this way. So, the free surface should be free of shear that means the shear due to viscosity is balanced by the shear due to surface tension ok. So, what we are writing so this is like mu du dy is for the viscous shear and uh, shear due to surface tension you can write for example, del sigma del x. So, del sigma del x is del sigma del t into del t del x where sigma is the surface tension coefficient. So, del sigma del x is a shear stress because of gradient of surface tension where sigma is the surface tension coefficient. So, y is the for example, is the direction normal to the interface and x is the direction tangential to the interface that is what nomenclature we are considering. So, you have del sigma del del sigma del x as del sigma del t which we call as sigma t or temperature coefficient of surface tension that means how surface tension changes with temperature that is the rate of change of surface tension coefficient with temperature. So, this is del sigma del t into del t del x or sigma t into del t del x plus del sigma del c into del c del x del sigma del c sigma c. So, you have two coefficients of surface tension one function of temperature another function of concentration and this is what you are writing along the tangential direction to the interface this is again a stress tangential to the interface and these two tangential stresses are balancing each other, but this tangential stress is a function of the normal gradient of velocity that is what Newton's law of viscosity tells you. So, 
and this is true only if you have v equal to 0, otherwise you have mu del u del y plus del v del x. But if you have v equal to 0, uh, that is if you have an interface where it is, it is, it is oriented along x, so you, you, ha you have no penetration boundary condition across the interface, so v equal to 0. The discretized boundary condition will look like this. So what you first do, you discretize the boundary condition. So you write this in terms of corresponding differences. So del u del y is like delta u by delta y. So like u i comma n y minus u i comma n y minus 1 that is delta u by y n y minus y n y minus 1 that is delta y equal to sigma t into del t del x like delta t by delta x plus sigma c into delta c by delta x. And then you rearrange this equation algebraically. What is your objective while we, you rearrange? While you rearrange you write u boundary u i comma n y, n y is the topmost one. So we are considering the top surface as a free surface as a function of u i comma n y minus 1. So you write, so always as we have already discussed, you write the boundary as a function of the interior, not interior as a function of the boundary because you are giving the boundary condition, not the interior condition. So boundary should be expressed as a function of the interior. So you can see that this do loop, uh, in this do loop you write the boundary condition in this way where you basically discretize this particular boundary condition. Uh, 